Amen? Amen. Amen. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you, Father, again, for all the victories of this church. Uh, the joy, again, Father, just continues to pour in. Uh, Father, your peace. Uh, Father, most of all, your presence here in this room. It's always evident to us that you're here. Uh, Father, I thank you for the worship today. Um, I tell you, that, Father, that connection that we have, Bojo mentioned that. You know, it's a heart posture. And, uh, Father, I need this church to know and understand that's how we connect. That's how we connect with you. Father, we need to do that more and more. I need this congregation to understand when things, when storms come, that's, it's time to worship. Father, that's when you want to hear from us the most. Um, Father, one thing that I always love about you is you never, you never told us we wouldn't go through storms, but you promised us that you would be there when we go through them. And Father, I praise you for that, for the storms I've been through, and knowing and having the peace that you were there. Father, today you are allowing me to preach a series that I've preached before. I'm excited to preach it. I thank you for that. Uh, Father, a lot of times you give me some hard things that I have to preach that, that, that to be honest with you, I don't really want to preach. But I'm always going to be obedient to you, Father. I've told you that from day one. I'll be obedient till it hurts. I'll push past it. But today, Father, again, you've given me something that I really enjoy talking about. And I just ask that you give me today... Father, your words, make sure, because I enjoy talking about it, Father, I ask that my pride does not get in the way. Father, I ask that you strip me of my flesh. And Father, that it is you that comes out of me today, that this congregation hears your voice, and that they understand that it is you, Father. So in this moment, Father, I'm asking that you anoint me from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. Father, that you take all distractions away from me that have gone throughout the week. Um, my anger lack of confidence. Father, I ask again, you strip that from me and you replace it with your courage, your boldness, and Father, most importantly, your love. I ask these things in your name. Help us to love, laugh, and forgive. Amen. As y'all heard me in prayer, I am super excited today to start this series called Warrior Marriage. I preached this series for the first time two years ago, guys, and, and right after I finished preaching, and I remember God telling me, you're going to preach it again. And just a couple weeks ago, as I was finishing up our series, as I was studying to finish up the series uh, of major growth, he told me it was time. Uh, and I can understand why. Uh, you know, we talk about this a lot, myself in leadership. We look around the church every Sunday, and there's a lot of new faces. There's a lot of new people and in the last two years, I would say that this congregation has almost doubled. And there's a lot of young couples here. Uh, there's a lot of younger people here. So I feel like that's why he wanted this series preached again. For those of you that were here the first time I preached this, God told me to tell you, you need to hear it again. <laughs> and he said, myself, Micah, too, myself included, okay? So I'm preaching at me again today. Y'all know that. For those of you uh, that were not here, okay, the two years ago when we did do this, over the next couple weeks, guys, you'll have a whole different outlook on what a true godly marriage is. I know that some of you are here and you may, be, you may not be married. Uh, you may be like, you know, what am I going to get out of this? I know there's some teenagers here. You're going to be saying the same thing, you know, but here's the thing, guys. It doesn't matter what your marital status is or your age. You can get something from this series, I promise you that. In fact, uh, some of you may not even be married right now, and, and that means y'all need to take some notes today, okay? And for you young people, I need y'all to take notes because you need to know what it is that God is looking for in a marriage. Today, we're going to go over, one of the, at the very end of this, the characteristics of, of what he is looking for for you to marry. So young people take notes take this with you it can definitely take you a long way in life regardless again guys of your marital status or age i promise you if you take this series seriously it will change your life but more important more importantly excuse me pointingly importantly it will help build god's kingdom and that's what our whole life should be about amen in fact guys i can tell you the the first time we preached this 
the overwhelming response that we got two years ago. My emails were flooded. The messages were flooded on social media with so many people that reached out to us thanking us for preaching that series. In fact, guys, there's one message that somebody sent us this week that I would like to read to y'all just to give you kind of a, an understanding of how much, number one, marriage, guys, is so important to God, and it's not preached enough. If you'll grasp this today, I'm telling you, it'll change your life. This is, this is the message we received. It said, hey, Christian Warriors Church, can't wait to watch your Warrior Marriage series again. I met my husband shortly after watching this series about two years ago. I went through a very bad divorce the year prior to that, and I didn't know if I would survive it. It almost broke me, but with faith in my family, I got through it. My relationship with God grew so much stronger over this time. This series completely changed my life when I found it on YouTube and raised my expectations and standards for what I wanted my future marriage to look like. Warrior marriage really changed me. I've watched this series so many times now. Because of this series, I asked my now husband to pray for us on our first date and asked him to come to church. I knew if he couldn't be a godly man, it wasn't going to work out. God was the topic of many of our conversations from then on. When we first got together, my now husband was not a strong believer. But within a few months of us dating, he got saved and has built a strong relationship with God. I have typed this message out to you guys so many times and never sent it. I truly thank your church from the bottom of my heart for the Warrior Marriage series. It changed my life. Y'all are amazing. God bless. Amen. So again, guys, this series, I'm telling you, can really help you, again, grasp what it is that a marriage should be like. If you're not married yet, what you're looking for. And then again, it will help you build God's kingdom, which is most important. Marriage is not being taken seriously enough today, guys. The media, TV shows, movies, the internet, and it's sad to say even some churches are downplaying the role of marriage. In fact, guys, I want you to think about this. 50% of marriages end in divorce. That's a statistic that most of us know. You've probably seen it, read it, so forth. That's worldwide. In the United States, it's actually 55%. And what's sad is you would think that it would be better in the church. It's 48% in the church. 48% of couples that go to church get a divorce. We as a church should be setting the example to the rest of our country and to the rest of the world of how this is supposed to work, and we're not. It's sad, we're, we're not. It's time that the church stand up and quit giving up on marriage so easily. We're going to discuss that a lot today. I want, to ask, I want you guys to ask yourself a question this morning. How can such a great institution, which is the foundation of family, by the way, be in such disarray in the world we live in today. It's because our world has a disconnect of how God intended the institution of marriage to be. So over the next few weeks, again, we're going to be discussing many different biblical points, instructions, and characteristics of what God intended marriage to be. But today, we're going to start with this, in this series by discussing two things. God's purpose for marriage. We need to understand that, right? You better understand at least the purpose of marriage. It is going to be destructive. It's going to be terrible. And the instruction of who God wants us to marry. That's the two points that we're going to have today. There was a man, by the way, that's the all that were here beforehand two years ago. Okay, I'm going to tell some of the same stories and same jokes. So just spiritually look at me. Okay, act spiritual and nod and laugh. Make sure you laugh. <laughs> if you don't laugh at my jokes, y'all don't understand what that does to a pastor. Okay, I need to be encouraged. Okay, so and that's part of the gifts of the body, right? Encouragement. I'm going to need you to encourage me. But anyway, long time ago. There was a man, thank you, <laughs> not yet, not yet, hang on, hang on, let me get there. This man bought an old house, it was an old house in the historic district of his town, beautiful home, bought the home, 
gets in the house, been there about a month or two, and he noticed some cracks in the wall of his house. So he picks up the phone and calls a painter. And he says, hey, I got these cracks in my wall. I need somebody to paint over it. Can you come and check this out? He said, yeah, I'll come check it out. So the painter shows up, and he goes over there, and he looks at it, and he putties up the cracks, and he paints over it, right? About two months later, same situation. Cracks in the wall. He got a little mad. He called the same guy. He's like, hey, man, listen. You came down here and fixed this. I got the problem again. It's in the same spot. I need you to come fix it. The guy said, no problem. Came down there, puttied up the cracks. Painted over the wall, right? Looked brand new again. A few months after that, cracks show up again. This time, the man got smart. He said, I ain't calling that same goober. He's just stealing my money. That's all he's doing. So he picked up the phone, and he called another painter. He shows up, walks up to the wall, looks at the wall. He says, sir, he said, uh, I can't fix your wall. He said, yes, you can. He said, just put it in cracks up and paint over it. He said, the last painter did it. And he said, no, I'm telling you, that's not your problem. The problem that you have is your house is on a shifting foundation. Guys, without a strong foundation, your house is going to fall apart. Your marriage is going to fall apart. Shifting foundations, that's, that's not what you need. You need a solid foundation. Solid foundation of what God intends the marriage to be like. What your home should be like. We're going to start from the beginning to make sure, again, that we all understand God's fundamental foundation for marriage. And by understanding and setting this strong foundation in place, we can all have a strong warrior marriage. Now, what is a warrior marriage? Michael, you got this as the title and everything. What's the definition of warrior marriage? Pull it up for me, Nick. A covenant between a husband and a wife who work together under God's authority to replicate his image and expand his kingdom. That's a warrior marriage. The number one way that we can build God's kingdom and reflect his image is through a true godly marriage. That's how we do it. The first thing we all need to understand, though, is that God didn't create the institution of marriage for our benefit. It's for his benefit. So I need everyone in here to grasp this right now, guys. God's purpose of marriage is not about your happiness. It's not. Your happiness is not the purpose, guys. Your happiness is the benefit of marriage. Not the purpose. It's the benefit. Some of you are looking at me like, well, my marriage ain't happy. We get there. We, we fix and get there. The problem today is too many people flip the benefit and the purpose. That's the problem. Too many people easily exit God's institution of marriage at the first sign of trouble and unhappiness. It's kind of like the pastor that, that was marrying this couple one time. And, 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 you know, you get to the part of the, of the ceremony and you say, if anybody disagrees that these two should be wed, speak now or forever hold their peace. And the pastor says this and all of a sudden he hears, I disagree. And he looks over at the groom and he said, shut up, you're the groom. Too many times, guys, people just exit the marriage covenant without fighting for it because they don't understand the true purpose of marriage, the true purpose. The purpose of, the purpose of marriage is God's plan. Uh, you know, that's the, the, the purpose is, but I do want to promise you all something. If you will stick to the purpose, the benefit of a happy, loving marriage will be created. I promise you that. If you get nothing else from this message today, guys, I need you to remember this. Again, your marriage is not a personal issue. It is a spiritual issue. That's your marriage. Quit taking it personal. It's a spiritual issue. I want to go to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to look at uh, verses 26 through 28. We were just there, but this is the sixth day of creation. Pull that up for me, Nick, please, sir. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, and all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male, and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and governing. Okay, we just read that, but what y'all need to catch 
God wants us to be fruitful and multiply and then govern the earth. That's what God wants us to do. That's the whole purpose of marriage right there. See, guys, the purpose of marriage is you get two believers, two strong Christian people, man and woman. You come together as one. You get married. You raise, you, you have children. You raise them in the ways of God. And then guess what happens? If you do that and you do it the right way, the percentages are very high. Your children are going to do the exact same thing. They're going to raise their children in the ways of God. And then those kids will raise their children in the ways of God. And guess what? God's kingdom is built stronger because there's a great example of a great marriage. And then you're just growing his disciples. That's the purpose of marriage. Again, it's show ain't got nothing to do with your happiness. Too many people, never mind, I'm going to get there in a minute. Now, because marriage is the number one way God builds his kingdom, Satan will do all he can to try and destroy it. That is right. Marriage is always under attack, guys. You know, Satan's a divider. That's his job. His whole job is to divide you from your spouse. That's his whole job. Because he knows if he can divide you from your spouse and tear up a home, you didn't set the example. What that shows people that are not believers or people that don't go to church is, is see, they're Christians and they can't even make their marriage work. You feel me? He's a divider. That's his number one job. And I'll be honest with you. In the United States of America, he's winning. 55%. That means only 45 stay together. And I promise you, the 45%, I bet 50% of them ain't even in a happy, loving marriage. I promise you that. They're just staying together for money reasons or for their children, which is good. They definitely need to fight for their children. But the problem is, is they can have that happiness if they'll stick to God's purpose of the marriage. Satan's smart, guys. He's slick. He doesn't come at you with the big stuff at first. When he attacks a marriage, guys, he he, he's not going to start with an affair or abuse or addictions or, or even finances. It's always something small. It's the little things that will annoy you. And sometimes it will be the dumbest things, man. Who in here has ever been in an argument with your spouse to where you don't want to want to want to Touch them, talk to them, or even look at them. I didn't say show of hands. Shame on y'all. <laughs> if you sit next to your spouse, you're in trouble. I'm telling you that right now. Y'all just, man. Man, there's this one time, man, Amanda got mad at me. She got really, really mad at me. And that don't happen very often because I'm a really good husband, you know. <laughs> but there's this one time that Amanda got really mad at me. And, and she didn't, you know, it was one of those things. You know, she didn't want to talk to me. She didn't want to touch me. She didn't want to even look at me. She didn't want to acknowledge I was in the room. You know what I'm saying? And I couldn't figure out what I did. It's like, what did I do? You know? So, so I'm hitting rewind, trying to figure out what I did. I went through everything in my head. Like, all right, well, last week I did this. Maybe that's what it was. And, and I'm like, no, she's been mad at me longer than that. So let's go back even further. And then I'm looking at a month afterwards. And I'm like, okay, she was happy here. So it's somewhere in between this lane. So I'm looking at everything, trying to figure it out. And I figured it out. I figured it out. What happened was, this was, this was during Christmas time. My job at the house is to wash the dishes. That's my job. I'm washing the dishes one day, and I'm drying them off, and I used the Christmas towel. <laughs> Men, that's decoration. That's not a towel. But I need y'all to understand, something is stupid as a towel, got me and her divided. Think about it. It's the little things that annoy you, and he'll drive a nail between you and your spouse. And the problem is those little things start to turn in to bigger things. They start to add up. All of a sudden, you've got a tower. You know, it's like putting Legos together, right? Like you put one Lego, put another Lego, put another Lego, and next thing you know, you've got this tower. 
Guys, and the problem is if you try to just knock the tower down, there's still pieces of it together, right? You still got those problems that you got to tear apart. You got to go one by one. And you get rid of them. Don't allow those annoying things, the small things, to add up. Because the next thing you know, again, those small things turned into something really big. Married couples must always be on guard against the schemes of the devil. But they can't do it alone. You cannot do it alone. We all need help. I want to go look at Ecclesiastes 4.12. A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated. See, see that's, what, that's what Satan does, right? He tries to divide you and your spouse because he knows one can be defeated. But two can stand back to back and conquer. So you get you and your wife together, you can conquer some of these things. You can make it work, right? Three are even better for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. You see, when you start to come apart as a couple, guys, you need to realize that Satan has attacked. He's attacked. And like this verse says, two can conquer, but if you have a third partner in your marriage called the Holy Spirit, Satan can't win. Christian warriors, you cannot have a strong marriage without the help and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit's a part of your marriage, the fruits of the Holy Spirit come with it. I know we just pulled this up a few weeks ago. We're going to do it again. Galatians 5, through 23. These are the fruits of the Spirit. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Notice I put marriage there. That's your life, right? So it can produce this kind of fruit in your marriage. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control or discipline. No show of hands. <laughs> Who doesn't want that in their marriage? When it's just you and your wife, yeah, you can conquer a few things, but, but you're not going to have these things with you. I mean, I don't know about y'all, but man, I, I, I want love in my home. I want joy. I want peace. Patience, I definitely need more of that. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Faithfulness. If the Holy Spirit's not in your marriage, it's going to be a struggle for both of you to be faithful. Gentleness, I definitely need a lot of that. And then, of course, discipline. If the Holy Spirit, guys, just think about it, man. For those of, you know, there's couples that are watching, couples maybe that, are, that have just gotten here. Guys, if you're not allowing God to be the center of your marriage, you're missing out on these things. Not that they won't come around every once in a while, but here's the guarantee. If he's in the center of your marriage, if he's in your home, those will always be there. You can't do it just you and your spouse. You have to have the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Here's the main point that you need to grasp again, guys. You cannot allow Satan to disrupt your marriage because when Satan starts to disrupt your marriage... He starts to disrupt God's plan and purpose for marriage. God's institution of marriage, again, is much, much, much bigger than your happiness. So much bigger than that. Guys, when a marriage fails, it sets a bad example for what God intended it to be. You know, that's what we were just talking about earlier, and that's why the church has not done a good job. I'll just be honest with you. And I'm going to tell you why that is. I call it... The commercial church. And what I mean by that is the commercial church, if you take, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Hang on. God, give me the right word. Give me the right word. Okay. If you take a big business and they become commercialized, they have formed to the ways of the world. They've conformed to the ways of the world. That's what's happened. That's what commercial churches are doing. I was talking to a man not too long ago. This is an older gentleman. And we were visiting about marriage. Came in the jewelry store one day. 
And he asked me, he said, how often do y'all talk about marriage and family at the church? And I looked at him, I was like, honestly, I think I put it in every dang sermon. And I said, because God told me to. And he looked at me, now this is a man, he told me this. He said, I've been going to the same church for 30 years. Not one time have they preached on the marriage covenant, divorce, any of those attacks. Not one time have they preached on it. That's a commercialized church, guys. Because people don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. They want to hear about the struggles. They don't, it makes you uncomfortable. You know, I promise you, there's people in this room right now that they're, they're, they're sweating. They're thinking, man, my marriage is terrible right now. It's rocky. Guys, you got to hear it. You got to learn. And we're better than in the church where truth is going to be given to you and then followed up with love and compassion and discipleship. I know it's hard, y'all. There's a lot of things that are hard to talk about. Y'all think I like preaching on this stuff all the time. But guys, I promise you, if you're going to grow, why not in the church? If you're trying to learn it out there, you're going to conform to the ways of the world where they're telling you, just get a divorce. Just get a divorce. We got to fight for God's purpose, not our pleasure. There's one more point I want to add before I move on to the next topic. When Satan attacks your marriage, and I assure you he will, you need to make sure you're going to the correct source that can help you fix the marriage. Don't go to your buddies. Don't do that. Don't go to the internet or social media. Do not do that. you got to go to the correct source. About four years ago, we got a new treadmill at the house. Circle was heavy. Anyway, we got it. Had, had to take it from the front door all the way as far away from the front door as we could get it in our house. That's where she wanted the treadmill. <laughs> and I just said, yes, ma'am. So we get this treadmill there, and, and, and it's in this big old box. And it was late in the evening that evening. I was like, well, I'll break it open tomorrow. So I took the day off so I could hang out with Amanda, and we were going to put this treadmill together. So anyway... We're down there the next morning, and she said, uh, you going to start putting that treadmill together? I was trying to, you know, prolong it as much as I could. I said, yeah, absolutely, baby. I'm going to get this treadmill together. And the next thing I know, she's gone. Oh, yeah, she was gone. She went up to the room. She was going to take a shower or something. And I was like, well, she'll be down here in a minute. So I'm going to go ahead and start putting this treadmill together. So I bust open this box, and I'm looking at the picture. And I'm like, you know what? I know I'm not the smartest dude in the world, but I don't need these instructions. It's not that hard. You know, I'm a country kid. I can put something together. You know what I'm saying? So I break out this thing, and y'all, I spent an hour working on this treadmill, and, and it about to fall apart. And my wife, my amazing, merciful, smoking, beautiful wife, comes down the stairs, and she says, how long you been doing that? I said, for an hour. She said, where's the instructions? I said, I don't need no instructions. She said this, don't you think the treadmill maker knows more than you do about putting that treadmill together? Guys, don't you think the marriage maker knows more than we do about how to build a strong marriage? Yeah. Guys, when you're struggling in your marriage, again, don't go to your friends. They're going to take your side. Well, not all of them. You, if they're a good Christian man like me, I'll tell you real quick, you know. But, but the majority, again, conform to the ways of the world. If they're not a strong believer, guys, they're just going to tell you, oh, if you're not happy, you just need to get out of it. Guys, when you're struggling in your marriage, there's only one place to go. And that's the instruction booklet. And it's all in there. And we're going to go over that the next four weeks, step by step. Let's move on. We're going to go to, since we understand the purpose of marriage, again, it's not about your happiness. Do you all understand that? Okay, good. It's not about your happiness. Okay, we're going to get there. Uh, now I want to discuss the instructions of who we are to marry. There are only two simple instructions, two and two alone, 
when it comes to biblical guidelines of who we should marry. First, God's institution of marriage is between a husband and a wife only. A man and a wife only. If you're a man, you should marry a woman. If you're a woman, you should marry a man. Okay. I want to go in back. I'm going to go back to what we just read again. I know I'm pulling up again, but Genesis 1, 27 and 28. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Male and female. And that's the only ones that can be fruitful and multiply the way that God intended it. Can I get an amen? amen. Dang, listen, Mikey's not here. I'm going to need you all to speak up a little bit. Thank you very much. A lot of times people argue against these verses and they say that it's the old covenant and that we now go by what Jesus said, which is the new covenant. And if that's the case, that's fine. I want to look at Matthew 19, 4 through 5. Haven't you read the scriptures? He's talking to the Pharisees here, by the way. He's getting on to them. Like, y'all sitting here trying to argue me about something. Hadn't you read the scriptures? That's what he's trying to say here. They record that from the beginning, God made them male and female. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Doesn't matter how you read it, guys. The first instruction God gives us is simple, and that is that a marriage is between a man and a woman only. Now, I want to add something to that. And I said this a couple weeks ago. If we have anybody in this church, or if we have somebody watching online that struggles with this, we love you. I love you from the bottom of my heart. And I ain't going to treat you no different than I do anybody else in this room. But I am going to have to give you the truth from this pulpit. And sometimes it breaks my heart because I do. I, I don't want to. I don't like to upset people. I hate it. But I took an oath that I'd tell the truth from this pulpit. But please know we love you. And you're invited here. Every sinner Every sinner is invited to Christian Warriors Church. I don't care if it's something of this nature. I don't care if you're an alcoholic, if you're a drug addict, whatever it may be. You are invited to Christian Warriors Church. Amen? Amen. We're going to teach you the truth, though. And we're going to hug you, too. That's going to happen. The second instruction that God gives us on who we should marry is they must be a believer. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 17. That's really small, so I'll read it to you. I had to fit it all in one slide, you know what I'm saying? Don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, we'll live in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among unbelievers and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things and I will welcome you. Right here, guys, if you want God to be in the center of your marriage right off the bat, you better marry a believer because it's telling you, if you do, he'll welcome you. He'll welcome the marriage, and he'll be right in the center. Now, I want to point something out. I have seen believers marry unbelievers, and I watched it work. I did. I watched it work. That believer ended up being a great example of how it should be but I will say this I bet the percentages are very small I bet they're very small 
In fact, of the couples I have seen, I've actually only seen one that, that has worked out, where it was one that was an unbeliever and one that was a believer. So those percentages, they're, they're small. Let me move on. I think I'm fixing to get ahead of myself. Okay. I'm going to discuss something that might step on some toes in this room, but y'all need to understand I'm, I'm aiming at your heart, not aiming at your feet. Of the two instructions that God gives us on who we are to marry, Nothing is said about the color of their skin. In fact, guys, I'm going to read a verse to y'all that pertains to this. This is instructions of remarriage in the event that a spouse passes away. I want to look at 1 Corinthians 7.39. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. If her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes, but only if he loves the Lord. It says nothing about race. It says they can marry anyone. Guys, I want to share something with y'all personal. It's the same thing I said two years ago, so if you were here, you're going to hear it again. Every single morning, every morning when I wake up, I get on my knees and I pray. And in every single prayer, every single morning, I pray for my three daughters and I pray for the man that they're going to marry. And my prayer is, God, I don't care what their past is. I don't care where they come from. All I want you to do, God, is make sure that they grab a hold of somebody that's going to love them like you love the church. I don't care if they're green, purple, pink, orange, or polka dot. If they're going to love my daughters like Christ loves the church, I'm going to love them. I'll accept that. You know, <laughs> I've seen a lot of, uh, of, of, of hatred towards this. And I've seen it, what's sad is sometimes I've seen it in the church. You know, I'll put it to you this way, y'all. I'm going to give a little humor here. Even if they were a Philadelphia Eagle fan, <laughs> if they really, really, really love my daughters, really, really, like Christ loves the church, I might love them. Let's move on. <laughs> nope. That is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is what that is. Uh, yeah, no giants, no commanders, no 49ers either. Go Chiefs. Come on, Chiefs. One more point on this topic, and I'm going to move on, guys. Um, there is one thing, and, and I have sat down with friends of mine that are interracial couples, and, and this is something that I've asked them, is I want to know the struggles that you've gone through. And I want you all to know that if my daughters were to marry someone of a different race, I would have that conversation with them to prepare them. And here's the thing, there's nothing wrong with that. You need to prepare your children for how the world's going to react to something they don't understand. Okay. So, so I would sit down with my kids and explain to them, it's going to be a struggle. Every couple I've talked to, that's what they've said. There's a, it's a struggle at times. But guys, if God's love is there, that's all that matters. 
And that's what we need to, to stress. You know, I don't, again, I don't care what the race is. Just love my daughter like Christ loved the church and make dang sure God's in the center of it. And besides that, it's going to work out great. The world has made a mistake of underestimating the challenge of marriage. Challenge is the hardest relationship in the world. I'm going to repeat that. Marriage is the hardest relationship in the world. You can't just walk out. You know, if you get mad at your job, you can quit. You get mad here at the church, you ain't got to come back. But if you just walk out on God's covenant, you got a major problem. You have to fight for your marriage. You have to fight through the issues and the problems and the heartache and the pride, all those struggles, the finances. You have to fight through that with your spouse every single day. You can't just walk out of that, guys. That's what cowards do. Next thing you need to know is when looking for a spouse, don't look at their potential, look at their patterns. Man, I preach this to my girls. Don't look at that potential. Man, I tell you what, them dudes that come up, you know, they'll be tall, dark, and handsome, and all they're thinking about is their potential. You know, let's look at patterns. Where do they go to church? What's their family like? Do they pray every day? You know, how's he act around other people? You know, does, is he respectful to people? Does he open the door for you? Does he, you know, I mean, come on, look at the patterns of things. I'm speaking to women, I'm speaking, I'm speaking to my daughters, I'm speaking to you guys too. Like, you really need to look at those things. Patterns are so important, guys. In fact, I tell you something really important, and God showed me this earlier. I'm going to read it to y'all real quick. It's in Proverbs 24, it's verse 27. You don't have to go there. I'm just going to read it to you real quick. I, I read this this morning. Do your planning and prepare your fields before building your house. See, the problem is, is you got a lot of you ladies, I love y'all, but you got a lot of you ladies, and it doesn't make sense to us men that, that, that you're picking out this dude, potential, that, that has no job. Yeah, come on. Has no job, no car, you can't go nowhere, you know. Don't go to church and you trying to figure out why your marriage sucks so bad. <laughs> you ain't got no money because he ain't got a job. Again, can't get nowhere. And he ain't going to church. God's not in the center of your marriage. All that great stuff from the Holy Spirit, it ain't there. All it is is just heartache. That's what comes with it. And again, y'all look at, but he's got so much potential. <laughs> he said, potential don't pay the bills. Potential also ain't going to pray for you. I promise you that. You got a pattern of that. Amen? Amen. Their actions better matter their, better matter their words, guys. Always keep that in mind. And, and ladies, I'm telling you, it's biblical. It's like that verse I just read. Don't marry a man until he's prepared to take you on. Do y'all feel me, ladies? Don't, don't do it. Daughters, don't do it. You make dang sure that man is prepared before he takes you on. One thing that you need to do when you're trying to find somebody to marry, guys, you need to test them. You need to ask them, again, where do they go to church? Oh, and this is always a good one, man. Oh, this is get them. Because you can ask them where they go to church, and they'll say, I go to Christian Warriors Church, but, but we only see them at Christmas, Valentine's, Mother's Day. You know what I'm saying? But, but that's where they go to church. So the next question you ask to catch these dudes that have so much potential, okay, is you ask them, hey, oh, that's great. I'm glad you go to church. What book are you studying right now in the Bible? Deer in headlights. I mean, they, they, don't, they, they don't know them. If that's the case, get away. I'm telling y'all how to test this stuff. Men do the same thing to ladies. I'm, I'm telling you. Ladies probably do read the Bible more than most men, though. Shame on you. Invite them to church. See how they handle that. See if they even come. Invite them to your home for dinner. Get, ladies, okay, I know I keep talking because I got daughters. All right, just get over it. This is what I'm going to say. If you got sons, just reverse it, okay? Just reverse it. I'll put it to you this way. If some dude wants to date my daughter and he won't 
come to church, unless he's got a church home, I'm cool with that, you know, but if he won't come to church with her, and if he won't come to my house to meet me, I don't think so. If he won't come to my house to have supper at my house, because one of the things I've always told my daughters, they're like, Dad, when can I date? I said, you date whenever you want to. You're just going to date under my roof right here at my house under my eyeballs. You know what I'm saying? So any dude that wants to date my daughter, they're going to have to hang out with me for a while before I trust them with my daughters. Amen? But here's what I need y'all to grasp. If they won't go to church with you, and if they won't come to your house and face your parents, you got to go. That, that, that person ain't worth it. It, it. That's a sign. That's confirmation, okay? That's what it is. And I know you teenagers, like, I get it, man. I'm so in love. No, you ain't. You don't understand it yet. I'm telling you right now. I thought I was in love a hundred times before I finally found the true love of my life. I'm telling you, you ain't in love. If that is a problem already, if they disrespect you, if they disrespect your parents, if they disrespect their parents, get out. I'm telling you. And that's one of the things I, I got here. I mean, one of the things you ladies can do is see how he treats his mama. If he don't give his mama respect, he sure ain't going to give you respect. I promise you that. Let's flip it. Men, how are they treating their father? And here's what I want you to catch. If they're not respecting their father, that is probably a pattern in the household. And that's how they've been raised. And I'm telling you right now, that's a hard one to break. If they won't respect their father, that means that his wife ain't respecting him. Because she's seeing this, she's seeing how mama treats dad, and she thinks that's normal. Run from that. Test these things, guys. Last thing I want to bring up, we talked about last week. Nick, could you pull up that slide of the characteristics of a pastor for me, please? Last week we went over this, and I said at the end of service for you men that this is how you should be. You should strive for these characteristics to run your church, which is your household. Amen? But, guys, what I need you to understand is whether you're a male or female, the person you're planning on marrying in your life, why not shoot for these standards? Above reproach. In other words, they're not bringing shame upon your home or on your marriage, okay? Husband of one wife, they ain't running around on you. Self-controlled. They're disciplined people. They're not going to get angry all the time. And they're going to be, di they're going to go to work. They're going to take care of things around the house. They're going to be disciplined, okay? They're not going to be lazy, all right? Sensible. They got common sense. Please marry somebody that's got common sense. <laughs> Respectable. Again, we go back to how they respect their family and so forth. Ladies, I'm telling you right, mm, you make dang sure that man respects you, loves you, cares for you. If he dishonors you and disrespects you, there's a problem. Now, don't get me wrong. We mess up every once in a while. Sometimes our flesh comes out and so forth. But if it's a pattern, then we have a problem. Understood? Hospitable. Able to teach. Don't you want to teach kids? going to grow the kingdom somebody got to be teaching these kids don't count on the church to do it all by themselves that's not my job my job is to teach you your job go teach your kids amen, amen. they over there teaching your kids right now but don't don't just rely on the church they're going to get one lesson a week you better be giving them a lesson every time you get the opportunity if not this world's going to cripple them i promise you that they ain't drunk all the time. You don't want a drunk person. You don't want a bully. You want somebody that's gentle. You don't want anybody that's quarrelsome or greedy. You know, one who manages their own household, somebody that can take control. Ladies, let me ask you a question. If, if your man, okay, if, if he was a godly man and he led your household the right way and he loved you like Christ loved the church, wouldn't you follow that man? Wouldn't you follow that man? Not a new Christian, okay? In other words, not an unbeliever, okay? Maybe that one, you know, maybe on the list, whatever. 
he must have a good reputation. You do want that, guys. You want a man that's got a good reputation. If not, people are going to look at you and think you're crazy. I'm just going to be honest with you. In closing today, we talked about how God's purpose and plan for marriage is not about your happiness, but ultimately about building his kingdom. However, at the same time, guys, again, if his plan is implemented, I promise you happiness will come. Because his plan was not for you to have a miserable marriage either. Understood? If you're struggling in your marriage, guys, right now, and you want to know how to get the happiness and the love back in your marriage, keep coming for the next three weeks. For the next three weeks. Next week, we're going to talk about the marriage covenant and how that should be properly managed in a marriage. Uh, We're going to talk about marriage unity. And then the last sermon is how to have a peaceful marriage. You better make it to that one. You know what I'm saying? Over the next few weeks, guys, again, we'll be discussing how if you can focus on God's purpose, God's benefit of marriage, which is love and happiness, it will fall into place. Amen.